Through the ages, 
Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. 
Praise the Lord. Oh, God is good. Amen. Aren't you thankful for our children? I am so thankful for our children. And parents, don't worry if they make a little bit of noise. That's okay. We're praying and asking the Lord to give us a plan so that we can have our children's church open when the school's open uh, and working on that. Um, but let's just, if you have a child near you and they're part of your family, lay hands on them. If they're not, then stretch your hands towards them. Let's just pray for our children this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for our children. And Lord, we ask that you will bless them, that you will keep them, that you'll make your face shine on them. Lord, that all the spiritual blessings that you have pronounced over us, we pronounce over our children in the name of Jesus. And even during this time, as they haven't been able to go to school and have their regular schedule like they, they usually have, Lord, we ask that you would even restore the time that the locust has eaten and that, Lord, that you would give them double blessing because of what they have had to endure. And we pray for all of the parents who have been home and having to be teacher and parent and friend. And we ask that you would give them new grace today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. If you have your Bibles this morning, let's open to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I want to speak a word continuing on. Um, with the theme of the weapons of our warfare. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5 say this. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Praise the Lord for his word. A few weeks ago, we talked about the weapons of our warfare. We talked about putting on the armor of God. And I want to talk this morning about the weapon of prayer. Do you know that your prayer is a weapon? That's not very many of you. <laughs> Do you know that your prayer is a mighty weapon? Well, some of you are getting it. <laughs> you see, from this scripture, from this word that we just read this morning, we realize we are in a war. If you don't know that we're in a war, newsflash, we are in a war. And it's not a natural war, it's a spiritual war. The Lord has said we're in a war, but it's, it's not a natural thing, it's a spiritual thing. But just because we can't see it doesn't mean that it's not real. But God has not left us powerless. How many say amen? amen. Thank you, Jesus that he didn't place us in this place where we're surrounded by war and battle and pressure without equipping us to overcome it. He has not left us powerless, but he has equipped us to overcome. If you notice that it says, see, these weapons of our warfare, they're not natural. We might not be able to see them, but they are mighty. They pull down the strongholds, those strongholds that are coming after your mind, those strongholds that are trying to place you into fear, to place you into bondage, to, to tell you that God isn't able to bring you through, to tell you that this is too weird of a time, that it's too difficult of a time, to, not, to cause you to be depressed, discouraged, disheartened, to not have hope. But these weapons that he has given us, let's look at this in, in, in verse 5. It says, casting down imaginations and every high thing. Every high thing. These weapons that God has given us are mighty, and they are effective, and they pull down every high thing. What's a high thing? It's a high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Fear is a high thing. Anger is a high thing. Frustration, confusion, those are high things. 
because they have exalted themselves against the knowledge of God who said he has given us peace, that he's given us his love, that he has caused us to be overcomers. And these things have come into our world and told us that God is not true. Fear is a liar. Not only has God given us weapons that will tear down every high thing, but it says that it's able to bring into captivity every thought, all of our thoughts, to the obedience of Christ, to the obedience of the world. Word, have you ever struggled with your thoughts in your mind? We have weapons not only to protect us from the high things that are outside of us in the world that are trying to tell us how to be, but also the high things in our own minds that war against our own minds that tell us, you're not smart enough. You're not gifted enough. God doesn't love you. Maybe he loves that one. If you were here last, week, last Sunday night, Mary had some testimonies that she shared. Well, maybe God would do that for Mary, but God hasn't done that for me. Maybe God would do that for that one, but God hasn't done that. That's a high thing in your mind that's trying to put you into bondage. But God has given us weapons to overcome these things. Amen? Amen. A few weeks ago, we were in Ephesians chapter 6. So let's turn there. Ephesians chapter 6. I want to look at verse 13. Man, I need a little bit more space. <laughs> and I brought the small journal today. There. That, there we go. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13. And it says this, now we went over this in, in length a couple weeks ago, Pastor and I. It says, wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. We talked about the armor of God. Everybody knows about the armor of God. We talk about putting on the armor of God. But we don't look at why do we need the armor of God. The next part of this says, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Well, guess what? It's the evil day. <laughs> it is a weird time. It is uh, pressure upon pressure upon pressure. I'm sure all of us at the beginning of this year, in January, as we started 2020, and when we were so happy and excited to start 2020, and God was speaking all these wonderful things about 2020, we did not expect it to be like this. We did not expect it to be like this. God knew it was going to be like this. That's why he gave us all those words in the beginning of the year to give us weapons in our hand. But we put on the armor so that we can withstand. God has already given us everything we need to overcome even 2020, to overcome in any evil day that we are placed in. See, skilled warriors, not that I have known this by experience, but skilled warriors first ensure that they are properly equipped for battle before they run into it. So God has already told us, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we are in war. So now, when you know you're in war, you need to be properly clothed for war. Properly equipped, prepared for war. And so how do we properly clothe ourselves? We put on the armor of God. Now, if you weren't here and didn't hear that message, I'm not going to go and repeat it. We don't have time. Go back and listen to it. Weapons of our warfare. We're talking about the armor of God. But first we have to have the armor on, but we don't stop with putting on the armor. So let's go to chapter, or the verse 17. Because a lot of times when I hear people talk about the armor of God, they talk about all of these things that we place on ourselves, breastplate of righteousness, helmet of salvation, the, um, the, the belt of truth, we've got some sandals with peace on them, and all these things. And then, oh yeah, and we've got a sword. And then we stop. Now, in these, this verse, verse 17, it says, take the helmet of salvation. That is the last piece of armor that is a defensive weapon. 
Whenever you go into battle, you have to be properly equipped. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to withstand. You're not going to be able to war effectively and confidently because you are vulnerable to attack. The first line of offense, offense is a good defense. You have to be clothed properly. But then you need to take up a sword of a spirit because if you just go and stand in the middle of an army with armor on and no weapon, you are not going to be effective. So if you don't, I mean, how many remember, read your Bible? Because this is your sword. This is your aggressive weapon. And if you don't have this, and you don't know this, then you are like a soldier with armor and no weapon. You will not be able to advance. You will not be able to take ground. You won't be able to fight. You have to have this, but this is not the only weapon. Verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. So we are to clothe ourselves in the armor of God to protect us in the time of war. Then we are to pick up the word of God and through prayer war with it. We have weapons that God has given us, and one of them is prayer. And God is calling us to a deeper time of prayer. Prayer is a weapon. The weapons that we have, they are mighty to take the word, to pray the word. The Bible gives us the words to pray. Prayer is communication. It's communion with God. Philippians 4, 6, you don't have to turn there, but I'll read it to you. It says, be careful for nothing, which means do not have worry. Do not have anxiety. Do not take thought. Just like Matthew chapter 6, do not take any thought for your life. Do not become careful about it. That doesn't mean not having wisdom and being foolish. It means not taking the burden on yourself. But by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. Now I want to make a statement today that I made earlier this morning. The Lord spoke this into my spirit, man, last night. He said, God does not respond to your need. He responds to your hunger. God does not respond to your need. He responds to your hunger. Scripture reference, you can go to 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name, and if you understand what this is talking about, it says when a plague or a war or they find themselves in the, in the evil day, this thing comes upon them. Then, if my people who are called by my name will, what do they do? Humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from whose? The world's wicked ways? Their wicked ways. Then I will hear. But they were in great need. And God did not respond to their need. He responded to their hunger, and their hunger was shown by their humility and their prayer and their seeking and their repentance. So when it says, do not worry, but by prayer and supplication, let your requests be known to God, that does not mean make up a shopping list. And then when you have your prayer time, we just, now I, I'm totally for making lists. I love lists. Lists are beautiful things. They itemize things. You can have color-coded, all different kind of lists, and I've made them all. I love lists. I make lists daily, multiple lists. And if the list gets messed up, I'll make new ones. And some of you have seen me do that. So I'm not saying don't make a list. But if the content of your prayer is just a list of wants, then you have missed your opportunity to be a warrior. If you're trying to convince God that you have a great need so that he will fulfill it, you're praying wrong. 
It does say, let your request be known. I just told you, let your request be known. But it starts with, do not worry. The prayer to just say, God, I have a great need, give it to me, is a prayer that produces nothing. It's not a biblical prayer. Lord, I need peace, give it to me. Why? Because I want it. Well, I'm sorry, that's not a prayer that's going to produce anything. Lord, I need peace in my mind. Why? Because your word says it's mine. That one's going to come true. There's a difference. There's a difference. The second prayer, I know, I know I just rattled it off really quick. I mean, your prayer should be longer than that, but you should actually spend some time with the Lord. The second prayer said something different. I know what you gave me in your word, so I'm asking for it. And that's why I'm asking for it, because you spoke it. I didn't speak it. I'm not asking because I have a need of it. I'm asking because you gave it to me. There's faith mixed in with that. Let's look at John chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. Don't you love the word of God? I mean, it's such an amazing book that you can read it and read it and read it for years and years and years and God always speaks something new and fresh to your spirit man through the word. John chapter 14 verses, I'm going to look at verses 13 and 14. I mean the whole chapter is really good but for time we'll look at 13 and 14. And it said, whatsoever you shall ask in my name, I will do it. We typically stop there. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. I don't know why, but typically when people quote this scripture, they quote the first part, leave out the middle, and quote the end again. Whatsoever you should ask. But it also qualifies what you're asking for. What is the intention with what you are asking for? The intention that Jesus says, that gives the promise that I will give you what you ask for, is when you ask with the intention that the Father may be glorified. So then that poses a question. How is it that we glorify the Father? What is it that glorifies the Father? Well, guess what? Jesus gave that answer. Just turn the page to John chapter 15. Jesus is still talking. Verse 8. Herein is the Father glorified, that you would bear fruit and be my disciples. So Jesus gives us promise that whatever we ask for in his name, he will give it to us. When the position that we're coming from in our prayer, when the intention of our prayer is to glorify the Father by bearing fruit and being his disciples. That's different than just going, hmm, what would I like today? Well, you know, it's not like a McDonald's drive through Can I take your order? The, you know, this is, this is not how we pray. We don't pull up, look at a menu of things and go, well, have a little bit of peace. I think I need some finances. Yeah, um, a little bit of, uh, I, could, I could take a little kindness today and a side of patience. Often that's what we do. We might not say it exactly like that, but the, the intention is the same. We look inside of ourselves and find out what we want. Instead of finding out what the word has spoken over us, instead of asking the Lord what will glorify him, what fruit do we need to be producing, what is he called us to be producing in our life, what is bringing him glory? A lot of times the content of our prayers is off. James chapter 4, verse 2. You don't have because you don't ask. Now, how many remember back the first Sunday that we were able to be back in the building and we had pastors Bobby and Martha Kirkley that joined us by video? Now, they were supposed to be with us that weekend, but the border was closed and they weren't able to come. And I was talking with pastor and the Lord put this thought in my mind. He said, you have not because you ask not. And I thought, that's right. I'm going to ask them 
to share a message for our church with us by video because that's the only way we can do it right now. And the only way that I don't have that is if I don't ask for it. So we got it because we asked for it. If we wouldn't have asked for it, we wouldn't have got it. So sometimes there's lack in our life because we haven't asked for it. And when we have asked, we have asked wrong. The next verse, verse 3. When you ask, you ask amiss. You ask off. You ask wrong. Because you're asking just based on your own desires instead of that the Father may be glorified that you would bear fruit and be his disciples. Not that God doesn't want you to prosper. He absolutely does. But seek first the kingdom and then the things will be added to you. This is all about the king and his kingdom. It's not about us individually. It's about our king. So God does not respond to your need, but he does respond to your hunger. What are you praying for? What is the content of your prayer? Have you ever sat down and thought about over the last week, over the last month, what have I asked God for? What have I prayed? What have the content of my prayers been? And are you expecting to receive when you pray? Or are you just praying words into the air with no expectation of receiving? Because those are prayers that aren't prayed in faith. And when we're not in faith, we don't receive anything from the Lord. The Lord asked me a couple years ago, actually, what is the content of your prayer? And I had to take a look at things, and I had to repent before the Lord because the content of my prayers was too selfish. There was too many, I want this, and I want this, and I want this, and I want this, and not enough of, you said this, you said this, you said this, you said this. When I was listening two weeks ago to Pastor Ted Ulbrich share on Daily Bread about what was happening in Cambodia, the Spirit of God really just hit me. Uh, I was actually a little taken by surprise. The Lord spoke to me the night before and said, you need to sow into Cambodia. Because I heard that Pastor Ted would be on, but I didn't know what he was going to say yet. The Lord told me, you need to sow into to that ministry. And then I heard the need, and the Lord was like, that's what you need to do. Now, now, now here's how you're going to do it. And I was like blown away. God gave us way more than what he even told me to ask him for. He told me ask, ask him for 1000 We ended up s- sending $2,250. That's amazing. From five people in four hours. That's amazing. That's amazing. But while he was sharing, the Lord said to me, your prayers are too small. Not that you need to cut out everything you're praying for, because I had already gone through a couple of years ago going, Lord, what is the content of my prayers? Help me fix this. But then he said, all right, so now you're on the right track. But they're still too small. You're asking for too little. He said, you're asking for things for your family, for your church, for your town. He said, I'm looking for people who will grab an anointing to feed nations. Psalm 2, ask of me, and I will give you the nation's for your inheritance. I said, Lord, I'm asking too small. I'm looking too small. There's a song we used to sing. I have made you too small in my eyes. Lord, forgive me. I've acted like you're not able to hear. I've acted like your hand is too short. God's hand's not too short to provide rain on a thousand acres of rice this morning, right now, in Cambodia. They still need rain. They got the miracle of the $30,000 to purchase the fertilizer, but I just checked while Pastor was sharing, and you can, it's FCOP International is the name of their ministry, um, and Ted Olbert, you can look them up on, on Facebook if you want to yourself. But as of today, they still have not received rain. They, they need more rain. They had to have a miracle rain a couple of weeks ago, but they have not received rain since then. 
So right now we're going to pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, your word says in Psalm 68 that you did send a plentiful rain to refresh and restore your people when they were weary. We speak rain over the nation of Cambodia in the name of Jesus. Open up the heavens and let the rain come forth so that the people may be able to eat, not just in the natural, but in the spiritual, but first the natural. So Father, send the rain now in the name of Jesus over those fields and then send spiritual rain to bring an awakening and a revival in the nation of Cambodia and send them out from that place to the nations to spark revival because of the miracle that you produced in their hearts and we thank you in Jesus name in the name of Jesus we need the Holy Spirit to teach us how to pray the Holy Spirit teaches us all things, and he can teach us how to pray. Now, I took a class not too long ago that Pastor Jeff did in 2016 called the Weaponry of Prayer, and he made a statement, and I had never thought of it this way, and he said, Jesus did not teach the disciples how to preach. He did not teach the disciples how to lay hands on the sick. He did not teach the disciples how to cast out demons, but he did teach them how to pray. He taught them how to pray. See, when the disciples, can you imagine watching Jesus work? Like, like I know we can watch him work through our lives, but can you imagine like literally seeing him and, and seeing him do these things? And they watched and they saw he'd pray and then great things would happen. He would pray, and then he would deliver these messages that would go out to thousands and captivate them for hours and hours and hours. By the way, I've been told that the attention span of people these days has decreased and that they can't pay attention in a church service more than 15, 20, 30 minutes max, which I find to be dumbfounding because also in these recent years, we have new things that have come about. We have binge watching. We have Netflix, and people, people like you and me, normal, everyday people, sit down on a couch, they click a few buttons on a remote, they push a show, and they sit there for four, six, eight, ten, twelve hours solid. And they watch, and they pay attention to these shows, and then they write blogs about the characters and shows that don't even exist and aren't real and they have Facebook groups, and they have little parties talking about the show that they just binge-watched for 12 hours, and they watched three seasons in one weekend, but they didn't sleep. They just got up from the couch to refill the popcorn and the chips. It's amazing that in the same time that people's attention span is not more than 15, 20, 30 minutes, that they can sit for 12 hours and binge-watch I don't think people's attention span has changed. I think people's priority has changed. I think people's hunger has changed. That was free, just throwing that out. Peter laughed this morning. It, th it made me think of that, and so they got it for free. I didn't want to drip you. Jesus taught them how to pray. He didn't teach them how to binge watch. He taught them how to pray. We call it, Luke chapter 11, we call it the Lord's Prayer. And, I, and I, I understand that, but if you want to be technical, it really is the disciples' prayer. Because the disciples said, teach us how to pray. So Jesus said, this is how you pray. So this is the prayer of a disciple. If you want to see how the Lord prayed, then you have to go to John chapter 17. John chapter 17 is the prayer that the Lord prayed. This is the prayer he taught us how to pray. Now, I want to go through this a little bit, and, and we actually have a little bit of time to read it this morning. Praise the Lord. We were short on time to th this morning. Well, 9 a.m. was, whoo. I didn't even have a cup of coffee. I was talking so fast, I didn't even know the words were coming out of my mouth. Luke chapter 11. H who is here this morning at the, for real? I was tired, and I, after I got done, I said, I think I said it to Tammy, I said, man, I feel like I came riding in on a horse, jumped off, and ran at people. I couldn't even believe the words were coming out of my mouth that fast. Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. 
for those of you who have a vivid imagination, I'm sure that was a wonderful, <laughs> a wonderful picture you just saw. <laughs> You're welcome. You're all welcome. You're welcome. I aim to please the Lord, not you, but it's okay. <laughs> He taught them how to pray. You know, the disciples would watch him pray all night. Then, then he would, like, walk across the lake instead of taking a boat. He'd pray, and blind eyes would open. He'd pray, and thousands of people were fed with a little boy's lunch. And they said, man, I don't know if we could preach like that, and I don't know about that other stuff that he does, but, man, if we pray, I bet you those things will happen. They saw that prayer was the secret weapon that he used. So in Luke chapter 11, it says, I'm going to, the disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. And in verse 2, he said to them, when you pray, say. Now I want to stop there. Pastor Jeff, if you have heard him at all in the last few years, he says this repeatedly. When you pray, say. When you pray, say. If you've heard him say that, it's because he's quoting Jesus when you pray, say. You actually have to open your mouth and say something. It's easy to think it up here. It's a little bit more difficult to say it out loud because somebody might hear you. Or you might hear you. It's not something that's stuck in your imagination. Prayer time is not imagination time. Prayer time is a real time. And when you pray, you need to be, have enough guts to say it. When you pray, say, our, our, not my, not theirs, our, unity. When you pray, unity should be key. You should be in unity with the body of Christ. There's too much division in the body of Christ. Too much division in the body of Christ. In our ladies Bible study, we just finished up the book of Philippians, and in the first chapter of the book of Philippians, the disciples were complaining to Paul and saying there are these people and they're preaching and they don't have the right motives. And Paul said, it is true, they don't have the right motives, but I rejoice that the gospel is being preached. So in other words, stop looking at division. See if there's anything we can be in unity over and forget the rest and leave it up to God and pray. Our Father, be in unity. Then it says Father. It's speaking of relationship. We don't, he's not some God afar off. He's not some man that's waiting to beat us with a stick when we mess up. He is our Father. Hallowed be your name. It's a position of worship. Our prayer, this is the, Jesus teaching them the prayer. Now, I have no problem with reciting the prayer, but it wasn't limited to just say these words. Grab the heart of what I'm teaching you. When you pray, you have to speak. When you pray, come in unity. When you pray, realize he's your father, and you're his son and his daughter. When you pray, come in a position of worship, exalting his name, hallowing his name. His name is holy. And because his name is holy, then you should be holy. Your kingdom come. Priority. First priority of my prayers is not my want list. The first priority is my prayer. His kingdom what is on his heart, not my kingdom, his kingdom. Your will be done. How do we know what God's will is? Because it is spelled out in the pages of this book. This word is his will. So not only is the priority of my prayer his kingdom and what he wants, but the words of my prayer is his will. As in heaven, so in earth. That is faith and expectation because I know what has been done in heaven according to the word of God. So when I pray, I don't make something up in my mind. I go into the word, find out what's already been established in heaven, and I pray that into the now. And I expect it to happen because I know I'm coming from a position of confidence that it's already done. 
I'm not praying for things that need to be done. I'm praying for things that are already done. Hebrews chapter 11, these died in faith, not receiving. They were in faith, they didn't receive it, but they saw it. They knew it was done, though they never held it in their hands. But they were in faith, because they saw it, they knew it was done. They received it, though they didn't have it. Give us this day, hold on, the words got small again. Give us day by day our daily bread. Give us today what we need for today. I know, God, you've already provided what I need for today. So I'm asking you to put into my hands what you have already spoken for today. And I'm going to come back tomorrow for what I need for today. And I'm going to come back the next day for what I need for today. Consistency. Faith. Forgive us. Forgive us of our sins. We haven't even gotten to the list of the things that we need yet. Forgive us. Repentance. Have you repented lately? If you haven't, you need to. If you need conviction, read the Bible. It'll convict you. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Get baptized by him. He will convict you. That's one of the things he does. He convicts us of sin. If you haven't been convicted lately, you need to have a checkup because the Bible says the Lord corrects those that he loves. If lo the Lord loves you, he will be correcting you. Actually, I just said to the Lord not too long ago, I, I, I haven't repented enough lately. Show me something because I'm not seeing right. I know there's stuff in there. Show it to me. I need to repent. I need repentance in my life. Not only do we ask for forgiveness, but it says for we forgive everyone. We forgive everyone that is indebted to us. Not only God cleanse me and I repent for my sin, but I release forgiveness. I don't hold things against people. I'm not going to be in bitterness. I'm going to do the good works that you have called us to do. Then it says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That's called humility. Humility. I'm not coming to the Lord in prayer in a position that I'm so awesome, I hope he just helps all you people. But that I'm coming with humility, knowing that even if the Lord put my heart to pray for you, that I need to be careful because the same thing that you're falling in, I can too because I'm flesh and blood just like your flesh and blood. This is how Jesus taught them to pray. This is the template that he gave us. And I don't believe that it's a technical thing. It's a heart thing. This is how you pray. It's about him. It's about unity. It's about repenting before him. It's about turning to him and seeking him consistently on a daily basis, coming before him and seeking after his kingdom. And yes, when you do, he will provide your needs. I shared this morning, the Lord spoke to me uh, uh, years back, I can't even remember how long ago, it was probably 2005, and he said to me, if you build my house, I will build yours. And I didn't really understand what that meant. It took a while to meditate on that. But yesterday I was sitting in my basement that if you don't know, if you haven't been paying attention, I've been having a renovation going on. I don't even know if you should call it a renovation because there was nothing before. <laughs> it was trash and scary. Um, so it was, it's a, it's a, vo it's a voation. <laughs> it was not a renovation, it's a novation. <laughs> we created something down there. And it's so much better than what I could have even imagined, and I can imagine pretty good. I've never been accused of having an insufficient imagination. In fact, my mother used to tell me to get out of my head and stop imagining things. But <laughs> for real, she did. She's like, you sit up there in your room and just imagine all kind of stuff. Got to get into reality. Um, it was a little bit deeper and more forceful. But <laughs> I was sitting there looking at that, and those words came back to my mind. If you build my house, I will build yours. And you know what? When you trust God to build your house, 
He does so much better of a job than you ever could. Look, the renovation in my house went awesome, not because of my planning, because of my God. He did so much better than I could have ever done. I was so thankful. I said, thank you, Jesus. Maybe it didn't come as fast as I would have liked it. I would have liked it 15 years ago when I bought the place. But you have need of patience. God has called us to pray. Not just prayers for ourselves. Prayers for nations. Prayers to go after the one. And I've been so blessed of, of hearing some of you talk about that, that that message that I spoke a couple weeks ago, go after the one, just resonated in your heart and that you've been praying for prodigal sons and daughters. You've been praying for those who you know used to be close to the Lord. Maybe they're not completely in sin. I mean, you don't have to qualify it that they have to be in a pig pen somewhere. Maybe they're just still a sheep, but they've isolated themselves and, and, and they're still in the sheep pen. They're still part but they've, the devil's isolated them, and they're discouraged. And we need to go after the one through our prayer. But we can't just limit it to the one that we got to ask God for nations, that we got to ask God for our community, that we ask God to annihilate these principalities and powers that are spewing fear into our society and making changes that are ungodly but that we pray, because if you have been paying attention, there have been a lot of evil things being uncovered. Do you know how many drug busts we've had lately? As we pray, more of that stuff will become uncovered, and the authorities will be able to go and take care of it because of the prayers of the church. Do you know that there have been several cases over the last couple of months of child pornography rings in our area being uncovered and brought to justice? That's a problem here. Sex trafficking? These are problems here. It's not just the economy. It's not just people need jobs. We need to pray that all the things that the enemy is doing in our land get uncovered and sent out so that his kingdom and his will can be established in our time. Because we are to pray and we are to watch, like watchmen on a wall, intercessors called to see what's really happening, who will not get distracted by what they hear a Goliath spewing out, but will focus on the word of God and war with it. Amen? So as we close this morning before pastor comes, I'd like us, if you would like a, a greater revelation, a greater anointing for prayer in this season of time to stand. And I'd like to pray over us this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word. And Lord, you've said that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty. That you have given us a weapon of prayer. And Father, we come to you today, and we are asking you to teach us by Holy Spirit how to pray, so that when we pray, things change, that when we pray, that, that nations change, that laws change, that circumstances change, that the evil that's surrounding us begins to be brought to the light and dispelled, that drugs no longer come into our community, that pornography no longer comes into our community, that those who are bound by addictions immediately become convicted and sobered in the name of Jesus and those bondages broken off of their lives, that families would be restored, that children would be brought up in the knowledge of the Lord, that marriages would be recovered, that families would be put back together, that people would receive the inheritance that they're meant to receive, that they would have the jobs they're supposed to have, that they would hear the ministry call that they're supposed to have, that people would pray and intercede and come into unity, and the division in the church would be annihilated. We want an anointing to pray because if we can pray in unity as a church family, there will be nothing that will be able to stand against us, but we will accomplish everything, all the things that you have spoken. Because your word says if they're in unity, nothing 
will be held back from them. So, Father, teach us to pray, but teach us to pray in unity as your church, as your body, in unity with your word, in unity with your spirit, and with one another. And we thank you. Now, Lord, we ask for grace to pray, for grace to change our schedule, for grace to change our heart, for grace to change the the position that we pray from, the way in which we pray to line up with the word of God so that our prayers are effective and that when we speak your word through prayer, immediately we see results and change. And we thank you, Lord, because we know that whatever we ask in your name, that we ask in order that the Father may be glorified, that you give it to us. And so we have asked you for an anointing and a grace to pray. And we know that you are going to Rain it down on us so we receive it by faith now. In Jesus' name, amen.